Fire as God in the Poetry of Robinson Jeffers The spring 1999 issue of Jeffers Studies includes a reference to a 1973 paper entitled Arson in Fiction, authored by one Gunnar Axberger, a Swedish professor of the history of literature. The paper suggests that fire may be a human archetype, a deep symbolism that some writers tap, often subconsciously, as a literary mechanism of emotional release. The picture features Robinson Jeffers as its primary case study, and also discusses seven Swedish literary pyros with whom Axberger was familiar. Axberger discusses 15 of Jeffers' fire poems, but Jeffers wrote other poems with something to say about fire that Axberger omits, including, but not limited to, Rowan Stallion, The Summit Redwood, The Beaks of Eagles, Original Sin, All the Little Hoofprints, and Continent's End. I dare say there's more fire in the poems of Robinson Jeffers than rocks and hawks combined. How's that for controversy? As we read Jeffers, we find that fire represents a number of things to the poet. Intense emotion, as Axberger would suggest. Destruction. Purification. Transmutation and change. Pleasure and joy. And last but not least, beauty. Why fire? Little about Jeffers' life seems to explain the frequency of fire in his work. He wasn't a pyromaniac. He wasn't even indicted. His life wasn't directly affected by any particular fire disaster. The Great War surely played a role in his maturation as a poet, but to what extent can we credit the war for Jeffers' heavy employment of fire imagery? Jeffers didn't experience the violence of the war directly, nor did he write about that violence in much detail. Jeffers surely wasn't channeling the spirit of the Indian fireplace that he built his home upon, though Hollywood may beg to differ. But maybe he was channeling another sort of fireplace. That fireplace we call California, or Big Sur. As recent as December 2013, wildfire struck the central coast again, destroying 34 homes in Big Sur, including the home of the fire chief. In 2008, the Basin and Indian fires consumed 244,000 acres. Before that, serious fires had occurred every 10 years or so in the Big Sur area. Jeffers wrote of fires that occurred in 1885 and 1909. Other major fires were also recorded in the same period. Perhaps local accounts of these fires left an impression on Jeffers. He depicted the Central Coast as a flammable place, both physically and psychologically, a place with a will or desire to burn. This infernal characterization of the Central Coast can be found in Tamar, Kador, the Summit Redwood, all the Little Hoofprints, Apology for Bad Dreams, The Beaks of Eagles, Fire on the Hills, and The Women at Point Sur. In Apology for Bad Dreams, we encounter a flame-like spirit. We have met her before, and we know what she wants. White as the half-moon at midnight, someone flame-like passed me, saying, I am Tamar Caldwell. I have my desire. After the fiery spirit passes the voice of the sea can again be heard. Jeffers says, Then the voice of the sea returned when she had gone by, the stars to their towers. So the voice of the sea and the stars themselves return after she has passed this fire. We then hear the voice of the sea say, Beautiful country, burn again. Point Pinos down to the Sur rivers, Burn as before with bitter wonders, land and ocean, and the Carmel water. It seems that the sea wants the same thing that Tamar wants, uh, yet more, 
no mere house fire. The sea wants a world fire, a conflagration, what the Stoics called ekpyrosis. In all the little hoof prints, we encounter a man who seems horrified that some passerby might start a forest fire. He said from his flushed, heavy face, That's the way fires get started. I'll kill anybody that starts a fire here. It seems the old man had a sense that the land might easily erupt into flame. The summit redwood is about a redwood tree's lifelong struggle to survive against fire from both earth and sky. Let us proceed to examine more examples. Ashes to ashes, cycles of fire. The women at Point Sur begins with fires igniting across the land. One is in Monterey, it's an oil fire, and another is a forest fire inland from there. The poem ends with the ignition of a mountainside. The fire there is seeded by embers from various campfires. Jeffers uses the term seed for those embers, by the way. In 1928, the poem Kadur begins with a large wildfire. It seems to pick up where the women left off. In this poem, the climax occurs with a man leaping through a fire to kill his son. Fire here is the medium of murder. But this man is but a pawn to fate, so claims his wife Fira who says that she controlled him and made him do what he did. Interestingly, she also wants the waters to become fire, just as does the sea in Apology for Bad Dreams. And here's the murder scene. Cotter blindly came through the fire. The body leaped and struck while the mind, astonished with hatred, stood still. There had been no choice nor from the first any form of intention. He saw Hood's body roll away from the fire like a thing with no hands. Later, here's Farah. Farah's face distorted itself and seemed to reflect flame, like the white smoke of a hidden fire, and she cried and said, I wish the little rivers under the laughing kingfishers in every canyon were fire, and the ocean fire. A little after that, she says, I pressed him hard and set fire to his body. Now this is an old tale from Greece about someone named Phaedra. Phaedra here takes Phaedra's place, but I'd like to add that in ancient Persia and in Ferdowsi's Shanime, Phara is a glow in the face of a champion of God, or a Shah, now this glow, this term, is used in other connections in Persian literature. It's a very familiar term. Shiva. Now for Jeffers, fire is a destroyer, but a creative destroyer. One that sustains his eagles, for instance. In the beaks of eagles, an eagle survives off fire, or is fed by a fire, and nests in a fire scar. In Fire on the Hills, Jeffers concludes the destruction that brings an eagle from heaven is better than mercy. After, after describing how an eagle gets access to prey thanks to a fire. Now Jeffers depicts fire as more than a mechanical recycler. He sees life itself as a fire, a cyclic fire. Here we have a couple of passages. Endless return, all, all the eternal fire wheel. And its underforest has died and died and lives to be burnt. So here we have a sense of turning and returning in a context of fire. Now, Tamar, vision and resignation. Tamar is a poem about place, or perhaps a narrative prayer about place. In this poem, fire is an unsurpassed power and an object of worship, a god of destructive purification, 
As Tamar says, nothing would ever clean them but fire. Tamar prays that fire purify her father's sinful house. O strong and clean and terrible spirit and not father, punish the hateful house. Fire eat the walls and roofs, drive the red beast through every wormhole of the rotting timbers, and into the woods and into the stable show them, these liars, that you are alive. Jeffers may have been aware of a parallel between Tamar and Melville's Ahab. Early in Tamar we see this. Visions gathered on that house like corpuscent fire on the hoar mastheads of a ship wandering strange waters. Now anyone familiar with Moby Dick should recognize the scene that this reminds us of. Tamar prays that fire cleanse her home, just as Ahab's harpoon is christened by seeing Elmo's fire, for the destruction of his foe, the whale. Ahab prays, O thou clear spirit of clear fire, whom on these seas I as Persian once did worship, till in the sacramental act so burned by thee, that to this hour I bear the scar. O thou clear spirit, of thy fire thou matest me, and like a true child of fire, I breathe it back to thee. Neither of these worshippers is particularly in good with God. There's a distinction between them. Tamar imagines that she can bend the will of her God, that she can influence events. Ahab, on the other hand, confesses his impotence, his powerlessness before his God, yet he remains defiant just the same. Now, Tamar finally resigns herself to the will of her God, that is, fate, yet her end is equivalent to Ahab's. They each perish in a swirling vortex of fate. For Tamar, that vortex is fiery. For Ahab, it's a watery vortex. Now, let us make it clear here that Tamar did not get her whale, her house. For it wasn't Tamar that actually burnt the house down. Jeffers wrote of fire as a primal phenomenon. In Continent's End, he concludes, Before there was any water, there were tides of fire. Both our tones flow from the older fountain. And we find this in To the Rock That Will Be a Cornerstone of the House. Wing prints of ancient weathers long at peace, and older scars of primal fire. But Jeffers wasn't the first... Hippolytus of Rome thus recalls Heraclitus, who inspired the fiery cosmogony of the Stoics. He asserts that this fire is endued with intelligence, and a cause of the management of the universe, and he denominates it craving and satiety. Now craving is, according to him, the arrangement of the world, whereas satiety is its destruction. For, says he, the fire coming upon the earth will judge and seize all things. Now, beauty is a fire. Now, just as Jeffers depicts fire as a destroyer, he depicts that destruction as a means to peace. Here are some examples. Peace is the ashes of that fire. And peace like a white fawn in a dell of fire. Now, think about that one. I should say this isn't referring to a fawn trapped and surrounded by fire but a fawn grazing on fire, a fawn of peace grazing on fire, gaining sustenance from fire. And finally, third, I'd rather be what I am, feeling this peace and joy, the fire's joys burning. That's Tamar's statement of resignation. Now, few images symbolize primal beauty more completely to Jeffers than fire. Beauty is not always lovely. The fire was beautiful. The terror of the deer was beautiful. And here, from the purse saying, I cannot tell you how beautiful the scene is, and a little terrible, then, when the crowded fish know they are caught and wildly beat from one wall to the other of their closing destiny, the phosphorescent water to a pool of flame, 
each beautiful slender body sheeted with flame, like a live rocket, a comet's tail wake of clear yellow flame. Note again, water becoming flame. To Jeffers, the beauty of fire is essential, it's fundamental, whereas beauty, like sexual beauty, is more derivative. And here he says, And make the necessary embrace of breeding beautiful also as fire. Religions of Fire Fire worship takes a notably erotic and mythological turn in Rowan Stallion. In the early going, the protagonist, named California, experiences a vision wherein a terrible and holy fire descends upon St. Mary. Within this fire is the baby Jesus. As California recounts it, the power, the terror, the burning fire covered her over. Now one with uh, Christian experience might equate this fire perhaps to the Holy Spirit being baptized in the fire of the Holy Spirit, for, for instance. Perhaps this is a divine act, wherein the baby Jesus is conceived. Later in the story, California falls to worship her stallion god, and thereby enters into mystical intercourse with this divinity. A fire arises in California's mind. The fire creates and consumes all the phantoms of religion. And just as mortal intercourse spawns mortals, this divine intercourse spawns gods, myths, religions, and the, and the like. The fire threw up figures and symbols, meanwhile. Racial myths formed and dissolved in it. The phantom rulers of humanity that without being are yet more real than what they are born of. And without shape, shape that which makes them. The nerves and the flesh go by shadow-like, the limbs and the lives shadow-like. These shadows remain, these shadows, to whom temples, to whom churches, to whom labors and wars, visions and dreams are dedicate. White fire is a favorite image of Jeffers. Here it burns in the mind of California. Figures and symbols, castlings of the fire, played in her brain, but the white fire was the essence. Ishmael of Moby Dick, by the way, claims that the white fire was deemed most holy by the ancient Persians. In the heart of the poem, the poet turns to us as if to unveil the whole point of the poem. Humanity is the mold to break away from, the crust to break through, the coal to break into fire, the atom to be split, tragedy that breaks man's face and a white fire flies out of it. For itself, the mold to break away from, the coal to break into fire. This sounds a little like Nietzsche's Zarathustra. I teach you the overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. The overman is the meaning of the earth. I beseech you, my brothers, remain faithful to the earth. Here it seems is the mystic path of Robinson Jeffers. In the words of Orestes from The Tower Beyond Tragedy, to go behind things, beyond hours and ages, and be all things at all time, in the returns and passages, in the motionless and timeless center, in the white of the fire. This, it might be said, transcends even any conception of God, so we have it that at the end of Rowan Stallion, God is murdered, uh, California shoots the stallion dead. From Apology for Bad Dreams, as with Tamar, we get the sense that this is a humbling path, a path of resignation. I have seen these ways of God. I know of no reason for fire and change and torture and the old returnings. Hasty Conclusions and Tenuous Connections Robinson Jeffers, as much as any, ought to be regarded as a fire poet. Why? Well, Jeffers' muse, in this regard, was the land where he lived. Jeffers' God is wild, impersonal, inhuman, destructive, and beautiful. A God of fire. Connections 
Elijah of Mount Carmel says, The God who answers by fire, he is God. Ahab, namesake of Elijah's king and defiant fire worshiper. Ahab's enigmatic Persian spirit guide, Fedala. Heraclitus, that Greek subject of the Persian Empire. Heraclitus saw fire as a symbol of truth and universal order, as did the ancient Persians. Now here's a passage from uh, Zarathustra himself, saying, To his question, Whom dost thou wish to serve? I then replied, Thy fire. As long as I shall be able, I shall respect that truth is to have a gift of reverence. Truth. Now Jeffers didn't know much about Zoroaster, I'm quite confident, but he did know his classics. Could he have been unaware of all this? And finally, here we have Elijah's view. The first sunset of 2014 from the summit of Mount Carmel, a dozen days after that big surf fire.